unfortunate that I have no slides. <laughs> so I guess I'm gonna take this on the fly. Um, I think uh, awareness being the key to patient engagement, I'm hoping that we can create enough awareness here without slides. It's a little bit of a freak out for a data person to be without data. But uh, I guess it all really comes down to that everyone has a story. Um, my name is Mette, I'm the founder of MyMe. I'm from Legoland, also known as Denmark. Um, I'm here because I was 14 when I got my first autoimmune condition. I never really felt right from that moment onwards, but my first half of my 20s was a constant uh, battle with undiagnosed. I was in and out of hospitals and nobody could figure out what was wrong. The second half of my 20s was um, kind of collecting disease labels and drugs as candy, a very different story. And I entered my 30s, a cardiac patient with six autoimmune conditions on a Molo cocktail of drugs, including immunosuppressants, and was told it was a chronic disease and I should be happy that we had been able to manage my disease the way that we had. Um, 10 years after being sick, my doctor's team called me and told me that they had great news and then proceeded to tell me that I wasn't gonna die in the immediate future. I was the CEO for a company at the time and I remember thinking, if I went to my board of advisors and told them we're not gonna go bankrupt in the immediate future, I'm pretty sure I'll be out of a job. So I had the courtesy of asking, what are we gonna do about my process? To what the answer was, we're happy with your numbers. They could have said a lot of different things, but I'm an economist and I'm autistic with numbers. So I basically saw eight years of EKG data in my head and I was just, you're not gonna help me. You're basically, you're well-meaning, but you, you don't have a clue of what's going on. So I shook his hand, I said thank you, and in my head I was like, I'm never coming back. I had no idea where I was going. Um, it's actually it's weird. Still emotional for me because it was, you're so disempowered as a patient when you leave that day. Up until that point, you've had this notion that you had all of these superpowers, all of these doctors that were to your availability and they were gonna be the ones championing you being able to actually get through this. And all of a sudden, you're on your own and you are the one that have to figure out what this is. Needless to say, I didn't think, oh, I'm gonna found a company. I thought, if I can just like get some sort of control and being I'm an economist, I turn to the one thing that has always made me, you know, relax, numbers. So I tracked everything. I was like, you know, and this was pre-apps, it was pre-quantified self, it was like notebook style and then transferring it into Excel spreadsheets at the end of the day. Um, I made a homemade algorithm and in five months I proved I wasn't a cardiac patient. And I thought, hold on, like I was a cardiac patient before I became anything else and everything could be explained by the fact that I was at heart risk. So maybe all of these autoimmune conditions could be reversed as well. And it was in, a, you know, hypothesis testing, A-B testing, but basically 16 months later, I had normalized my blood work, I was off all of my drugs, I have been symptom free for six and a half years, and I thought, wow, I just flushed my 20s down the toilet, for what? And I decided to see if there was a way for us to help others. At first it was a garage project, um, but it really came down to self-tracking, and I was a big part of another family called Quantify Self for many years. And when people say self-tracking, so I use self-tracking to debuff my own health, but self-tracking to most people is a Fitbit. It's a passive tracking device, and the promise of Fitbit was, we're gonna walk 10,000 steps a day, and if you only reach 3,500, you're gonna change your behavior seeing that you're lacking 6,500 steps. But that's where it failed us, because most people actually just shove that device in the drawer when they realized it wasn't gonna magically happen. And the worst part about it was, or the, the failure point was, that what's the impact of less steps? And I think that's where what we ended up doing comes in, because passive tracking is something that happens in the background. And when you wanna create an awareness around what's happened, you need to have people engage. So what we do is, is active tracking, it's actually having people self-report. It's what I call pay attention technology. Uh, my company, Miami, is a digital therapeutics program. It's a combination of patients actively reporting what they do, um, us doing a lot of number crunching and artificial intelligence on the backside to detect triggers and understand what are the behaviors and environmental triggers that actually contributing to these autoimmune conditions. 
so that we through health coaching and behavior change can enable that people reverse their disease symptoms and in many instances get off drugs. So if we, um, let me just look, um, if we kind of, um, uh, if we kind of think of um, what we do from this awareness perspective, I think the most important part is for me that we can create an understanding for the individual around what it is that is making the difference. So when you start a program with us, we actually have people snap a picture of everything they eat for five days. It's not because that's very interesting, but it because it trains people in, in tracking and just by snapping a picture of what people do, they're already altering their experience. And a lot of times they come in and they go, oh, I, I didn't realize that I was eating pizza every day, or I didn't realize that I had seven buckets of coffee, or whatever it is, because we have like this idealized version of who we are, and then we kind of have this, um, you know, a doppelganger, I don't know if you view but I don't know if that's the word you use here, but mm -hmm. you have like this other one, and, and, and all of these exceptions that we all think we only do once in a while, that's actually happening three times a day, those impact our health. So I'm a big opponent that what our lifestyle and environment does has a huge impact on our immune system responses. It's almost like we're talking about immune dysregulation and our bodies are right now, you know, we're supposed to go outwards when something is attacking us. But for all of us with an immune disease, it's kind of turning the other way. We don't know necessarily why, but by actually showing people the correlations and showing them that, hey, when, when you're eating nightshades, you have all of these flares. Let's try and take it out of your diet. Have people actually see the change. And, and another part of our program is that we reintroduce and relapse everyone before they're out of the program. Because what we saw with patients five years ago was they flew by through the program, felt better, they went into their lives, and then six months later, they're like, it didn't really work. But in reality, when we started looking at what they were doing, they had a lot of things that snuck back in. So if you show somebody that by removing A, you get better, and by reintroducing it again, you get worse, and it's while you have the data, you can actually make that awareness. And then it's a very different thing, because most people have been told a hundred different things by all of the specialists that they've seen. And over the years, it's become harder and harder to actually figure out what to do and what not to do. So they're interchangeably cheating on all of these rules. What we are able to do is basically say, these are the two hard rules. Never cheat on those and you'll be fine. So what, the reason that the, the slides that are missing is basically data on a few e-patients that I met here last year. I've been coming to Medicine X since the beginning. We had a, we put up like this uh, quantified self workshop before the first MedX. And um, I love having conversations with e-patients here. I love the interaction, but last year, I was dumbfounded by the amount of people that were here from celiac foundations, from type one diabetes foundations, because in reality, they shouldn't be here, right? If you have diabetes, somebody gives you insulin, you should be fine. If you have celiac, you should stop eating gluten, you should be fine. So I was having these conversations, and as I was talking to people, I realized, well, they were up against the same problem as I was when I had one label that was overshadowing everything, which was they go to the doctor and say, you know what, I'm feeling like this body ache, and the doctor will be like, you probably had some gluten you didn't realize, or you're probably eating more sugar than you are. So what, what made me look at these groups was basically, we are looking at autoimmunity at large. Everybody knows that when you have an autoimmune condition, the chances of you having three or four is big. But for some reason, if you have a very well-defined area like celiac or type one diabetes, no, no, no. In that case, that's a solo incident. We've established some very strong correlations between how she was feeling and what was actually happening. So the most noticeable one was that 13 hours before ketosis, she always had a raspy throat and a runny nose. So all of a sudden, now you had a clue and you had a window of intervention. Knowing 13 hours in advance of ketosis that you, it's coming, you have hydration, insulin, carbohydrates to actually change the state. So what we did was really by just looking at her body signaling, we were able to reverse some of the kind of, um, you know, roller coaster rides that you would rather be without. Um, and I think for me, the body signaling, and this is not necessarily a case, but it's more like to, to illustrate 
that it's a very different way of thinking. Since we're not looking at data, let's talk about what it is all about. We, um, as human beings, as children, we do what, what we need to do. We sleep, we eat, you know, as needed and as required. And as we go through life, you know, your boss calls you and says, I need this tomorrow morning. Four shots of espresso and three hours of sleep later, you're like, yeah, I can do this. It's perfectly fine. But over an, a duration of many years, you might find yourself with a sniffle or runny eyes or something else. And you go to your GP and your GP tells you, not a problem. We are in April. It's seasonal allergies. Benadryl will mask this up. There's no problem. It's very common. But the problem is that as you go along, if you have an autoimmune reaction, it's not going to stop just because you mask the, sim the signals. It's just going to turn up the volume. So at some point, you're going to have a full-on inflammatory response, at which point the healthcare system says, now we have a very complex problem, so we need a much bigger you know, intervention. And at this point, you're on immunosuppressant drugs. Immunosuppressant drugs is, you know, like you don't even know who you are at this point, and there's definitely no signaling. I can promise you <laughs> that much. But I think what, what is interesting about ending in that place is that we are, we are constantly expecting that by um, kind of lowering the immune response, things will kind of quiet down. But on the backside, because we're not listening, things are actually, the volume is being turned up significantly. Um, where do I want to go with that? So, so as an example, I, my ex-boyfriend, on our second date, I thought, is it too early to tell somebody that they're dairy intolerant? And I, I held back. <laughs> but I'm Danish, so on date three or four, I was like, you do know that you're dairy intolerant, right? And he looked at me and he goes, the most frustrating part about this is that you don't put a question mark at the end of that sentence. And I said, well, you have a rasp on your voice every time you eat yogurt, so I'm pretty sure I don't need that. And, um, and needless to say, he, he actually, of course, did not want my help, so he did it in an Excel spreadsheet and came back and said, it, you're right, like, but I don't understand it. I'm Indian. I eat dairy every single day. How can I be intolerant to it? And I said, I, I don't know, but let's you know, try and remove it. And that winter was the first time since childhood that he didn't have bronchitis. His anxiety went away, his skin cleared up. Like there was a lot of improvements from not having dairy. And I thought, great, now we're in a happy place. And then I came home a few weeks later to him saying, we killed my dad. And I was like, hold on, what? And he said, my dad had an autoimmune inflammatory disease that prevented him from breathing. And while he was on the ventilator the last four months of his life, all we fed him was yogurt. And I said, you, you might have, but you know, not knowing so, it wasn't really your fault. And he said, would have been nice if you had said it wasn't our fault. But then on the other hand, he said, what do we do about this? And I said, the only thing that we can do is to be happy that you at 40 was giving a forewarning of what this could have led to for you. So instead of looking at the same trajectory as your dad, you actually have the opportunity of changing your life and changing the outcome, which is a gift that nobody can take. I think my biggest takeaway to leave you with is that aside from me believing that there is lifestyle and environmental triggers that have a huge impact on autoimmune disease, it is that the healthcare system at large believes that complex medical problems require complex medical solution, and that is not always the case. Thank you. Thank you so much, Meta. I, yeah. That was perfectly said and spoken from the heart, and I can't believe you did that without any slides or cues. Um, I just wanted to let the audience know really quickly, um, and then we'll take some questions. I was a beta tester for my me, and I just happened to be announcing this session today. But um, personally, I was struggling uh, with autoimmune symptoms and neuropathy in my fingers. And um, I worked with a, a coach named Josh and did tracking and figured out, I, I actually needed Josh's um, reading of my data to help make this connection that it was an hour before I had burning and tingling in my hands and feet, I was eating high fructose 
um, sugars or fruit or maple syrup. And so to this day, that was five years ago, I don't eat those foods. Um, so I really believe in this methodology and also um, the importance of having a coach, someone to really interpret what's happening because we each can track what we're doing, you know, all day, but sometimes we need that other person in the view or, you know, in the, in the frame, I guess, to help interpret and, and give us um, that important, those key kind of insights. So, yeah, thank you. Um, okay, let's take some questions. Well, first, <clears throat> thank you so much. I thought that was awesome. Like so many of us have all these blind spots and don't understand the correlations or causalities between what we do and uh, and what happens in our lives. Uh, my question is more like an economic one, like who do you think should pay for that? Because it's a lot of value to the individual. Maybe I can afford it, uh, but it would also tremendously benefit from people who cannot afford it. Yeah. My hypothesis is that payer should pay you to do that, but I wanted That's to, actually to what we're doing right now. So, uh, so, uh, so we started out with the same issue, right? So at first we charged three grand, and you know, Mount Sinai and the Upper East Side was having a field day referring lupus patients to us. But in the end of the day, it was marginal improvement. And whenever we do beta testing, we always do it in low wealth populations. So we would take people from Tennessee to the Bronx, and in one of the lupus studies we did we saw a, a, like it's a 10x in the improvement. And we looked at each other and we said, really, these people are never gonna be afford any high charge functional medicine, it's just out of the question. So we decided to embark on this journey of how to give it for free. So we've actually, despite being you know, a, a team of people that really believe that we could have done this outside of the, the, the way that things are done, we are doing clinical trials with Cornell, UCLA, and a lot of hospitals to basically prove this out to get reimbursement through insurers. We are currently in talks with four different insurers around reimbursement models that are basically, we are giving away the service for free, 100% at risk, and then 12 months later, we are getting a percentage of the savings of that patient. Um, so to give you a frame of reference on the cost of these diseases, uh, I was on eight different drugs, which is very low for, you know, the. The, the, the spectrum of, of patients that we, we work with in general, one of those drugs was 60 grand a year. So when we're talking about a patient population that we've never worked with anyone who is less than $50,000 a year. So there is a significant reduction and insurance, are, they're interested in the monthly payment cadence. They will give us a reimbursement on the drugs. They're not interested in kind of like the tipping, like the hospitalizations and stuff, because you can't prove that it was your intervention that that reversed that. But I love that you said blind spot because that's totally what it is. We all have blind spots. Um, yeah, in a similar vein about blind spots, there you're trying to capture data about many signals that patients have been ignoring for years. How do you? Um, sort of balance taking in as many signals as possible so that you can find what the problem is, but also not fatiguing the patient who's trying to track every single action in their life. So, so there's, there's two kind of things to that. So first of all, if you had worked with us five years ago, you had to be a lunatic. Like we would, like we literally hooked you up with like all sorts of devices. We took every kind of data because we're working with Carnegie Mellon and we, we were in a research environment where we thought more data is better. But what we've really seen over the years is that that's not the case. It's about uh, unraveling the process in the right way. So what took me 16 months, we can now do in 12 to 16 weeks, um, where we typically were tracking six to eight different metrics, plus passive tracking on top in the past. Today we are typically tracking between two to four things at any given time. So you have to look at it as if, let's say we have a cohort of 20 people going in, the first week you might track the same thing, but then every single week the technology is tailored to you. And it's actually tailored to you even in the way that if you are, let's say we are taking somebody of antidepressants and it feels like they're having a chemical flu on the day when they're not getting their drugs, then their topic is gonna say chemical flu. It's not gonna be the regular, you know, side effects or withdrawal symptoms that we're tracking because people have to feel 
um, a, a, an innate relation to what they're tracking for it to make sense. So it's a, it's a huge part of it is actually that the tracking fatigue can't be a part of it. But also, if you're taking out, if you're having your appendix taken out, you're going to the hospital, you have it taken out, and hopefully you'll be back in 48 hours. What I see tracking as is not a, a, a thing that you should continue for life. It's an intervention. It's something you do for a period of time to understand the correlation and an impact, and then you go on with your life.